Ever since the valve was added to the trombone for the first time in 1839, bass trombonists were able to play the low F partial without having to switch to a bass trombone in F. But the only issue was that even with the valve activated, the slide wasn't long enough to play a low B. Even having to play a low C with the F attachment required you to move the slide almost to the point where it falls off. You could still fake a low B with the slide in that position by forcing the pitch down with your lips, but it wouldn't sound nearly as good if it were mechanically possible. That's why most bass trombones have two valves. The added tubing provided by the second valve not only makes a low B possible, but possible in a far more reachable position as opposed to stretching your arm out to the end of the slide. Some only have one which are often used when you don't need two, but the overwhelming majority of bass trombones have two valves. But it begs the question, how did the double valve bass trombone come to be? Welcome to the Trombone Channel, I hope you enjoy. <laughs> Back in the 50s and 60s, three bass trombonists of leading symphony orchestras told three different stories about how it was invented. They were Ed Kleinhammer of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, Alan Ostrander of the New York Philharmonic, and Kauko Kahila of the Boston Symphony. Ed Kleinhammer said this, In the early 60s, I went to see Vincent Bach at a convention in Chicago and told him, we need a double valve bass trombone, but he thought it would be too expensive, so he didn't make one. Then I shared the idea with Alan Ostrander, who shared that idea with Reynolds. They liked the idea, and as a result made the first double valve bass trombone. At the same time, I went to Holden in Elkhorn, Wisconsin, who also agreed to make one, and that's how it was invented. Kauko Kahila had this story to tell. Well, the bar tag list from low B to F made me wonder how I could solve that problem. I went to Reynolds with my design, and they made it. Therefore, I invented it. Alan Ostrander's story goes like this. Kleinhammer worked with a repairman west of Chicago, and I co-designed the instrument with him at Reynolds. Then they had three prototypes, one for each of us, including Kahila. I had ideas for the design, but even then, he had better ones. Therefore, Reynolds made the first double valve bass trombone, and that's how it came to be. With those three different stories in mind, who was right? Well, since Kleinhammer and Ostrander partially corroborated each other's story, and Kahila is acting like a lone wolf, we would tend to agree with the first two. And since Reynolds is mentioned in everyone's story, we would believe that is the company which made the first double valve bass trombone. But who was actually right? Who really made the first double valve bass trombone? The answer is none of them. They were all wrong. Efforts to include a second valve actually began decades prior. It was uncovered in an article written by Doug Yo, published in the ITA Journal in July of 2015. Thanks to his efforts in collaboration with a bunch of other people he worked with, we can now uncover the true history of the double valve bass trombone. Our story begins in 1910 with this double valve tenor, yes, tenor trombone made by a company in Paris named Lefebvre. The second valve lowers the pitch of the F attachment to E, allowing you to reach low B in seventh position. But the E valve was a static valve, meaning you had to turn it manually while not playing it. This trombone was played by Johannes Rochu when he was principal trombone of the Boston Symphony. The article states that it's currently owned by second trombone of the Boston Symphony, Stephen Lang, not to be confused with this guy who played Courage and Avatar. Some time later, a German manufacturer made what is possibly the first ever double valve bass trombone with the second valve pitched an E flat. The next double valve trombone was an F contrabass designed by Ernst Demel in 1921, and would you look at that? An inline, independent system of valves that you activate with triggers. Looks just like what we use today. I guess that's the end of the story, right? <laughs> Wrong! Demo's design went unnoticed outside of Germany and could have been useful for everyone around the world, but that didn't stop Americans from starting to make several of their own. The first American company to jump on the double valve hype train was Kahn, who, on February 1st, 1926, advertised two double valve based trombones with static E valves, including an image of the 70H. The next year, in 1927, Holton revealed their Symphony No. 6 based trombone, still using a static valve pitched in E. Two years later, in 1929, they advertised a similar trombone but with an E flat valve, and then in 1932, with an E valve dubbed the Model 69. Four years later, in 1938, Holton pulled the Model 69, and they wouldn't be selling any more double valve bases for a while. Something missing from these first American double valve bases were linkages to activate them while playing the instrument. Well, I have good news for you, because when Holton left the double valve chat, Olds from Los Angeles entered it. The Olds F and E bass model, later renamed to the S23, was the first American double valve bass to use linkages. A plausible theory as to why it was invented by them then was raised by someone named John Lowe. There was this movie that came out three years prior in 1935 called The Bride of Frankenstein, where the bass trombonist plays a low fortissimo B. The theory is that studio trombonists from Hollywood turned to Olds for a solution, leaving them to come up with this. <laughs> 
Fast forwarding about a dozen years to 1950, where we finally get to Ed Kleinhammer's story of the double valve bass trombone. It was then when he unsuccessfully persuaded Vincent Bach to make it, but two years later in 1952, he turned to a brass repairman from Naperville, Illinois, west of Chicago, by the name of Theophil Marcus Coder. It was then when he experimented with adding a second valve to a bass trombone, on which he also worked with Gene Isaac, who was bass trombonist with the Minneapolis Symphony. Yet, even though Coder and Kleinhammer were successful in their efforts, there wasn't much to celebrate. According to Doug Yeo's article, it is not known how often Kleinhammer actually used his coder converted bass trombone. No photographs survive of him with this instrument, and he was not known to have spoken of it widely. Following Gene Isaac's departure from the Minneapolis Symphony in 1956, Lawrence Weinman succeeded him as their bass trombonist. But on his audition for them, this is what happened. They asked every candidate to play the Bartok Gliss, found in the fourth movement of his spectacular concerto for orchestra. The Gliss is from a low B to F, which again is technically possible with just one valve, but would sound better if you had two. So when the orchestra's conductor, Antal Dorati, asked Lawrence if he could get the proper instrument for the Bartok Gliss, he assured him that he would get it. The only problem was that Coder had suffered a major heart attack and wasn't working at the shop anymore. Needing to improvise, Lawrence reached out to Vincent Bach, whom he had worked for one summer, and agreed to add a second valve to his single valve, Bach 50B. But Bach had no idea how to add the linkage to the second trigger, so Lawrence went to Vincent Clark from New York who owned the same old S23 bass trombone that had linkages. He agreed to have the trombone sent to Bach where and when it was based in Mount Vernon, just north of New York City. After much trial and error, on the night before Lawrence's audition for the Minneapolis Symphony, Bach had a second valve installed on his 50B. Just five years later, the Bach 50B II, a double valve bass with an E valve, showed up in Bach's catalog. The first one was sold to Edwin Anderson, who played bass for the Buffalo Philharmonic and then the Cleveland Orchestra. Bach actually used the fourth trombone part of Reinhold Gallier's third symphony as a selling point for people to play the Bach 50B II, since it had a number of low Bs. <laughs> Between 1957 and 1958, Alan Ostrander, Kauko Kahila, and Louis Cownahan worked with Reynolds to develop a double valve bass trombone. What they came up with was a bass with an E valve dubbed the Stereophonic Model Contemporary 78X. What's unique about this was that part of the F attachment actually extended towards the bell flare, making it one of the early examples of the open wrap of F attachments. It reminds me of the bass trombone that Ben Van Dyke plays. Meanwhile in Germany, someone named Hans Kunitz patented the design of a second inline valve to be used by the third finger, which became the standard for most bass trombones moving forward. But even though having two valves to play that missing low B was a nice addition to the bass trombone, people complained about the added weight of the second valve. <laughs> It became a catch-22 situation. Play a heavy but fully chromatic double bass, or a lighter, not fully chromatic, single bass. This prompted Kleinhammer to come up with an ingenious solution. Why not have the option to have both at once? In the early 60s, Kleinhammer worked with Holton to develop the Model 169, a bass trombone with a detachable E attachment. With this release, Holton was finally back in the double valve scene after many years. The definitive bass trombone it was, not for long. Two years later in 1964, Holton developed the Model 269, this time with a permanently installed E attachment. And then in 1971, when Kleinhammer's definitive 169 was discontinued, the 269 was relaunched with improved linkages. But even by 1962, Olds, Reynolds, Bach, and Holton were now all selling double valve bass trombones with E attachments. But what was missing? Technically speaking, nothing really. The low B had been achieved, but every E attachment I've mentioned depended on the F attachment being active in the first place, hence the name, the dependent valve system. So how do you get the independent system allowing the second valve to work independently of the first? Move them in line. With the two valves in line, air passes through both valves no matter what. This system allows for greater flexibility and more alternate positions in the lower register. Whereas the dependent system allows for only two valve combinations, the independent system allows for three. The first to put inline valves on a bass trombone was George Strusel from Los Angeles. He worked with Miles Anderson to add a second valve to a Con 70H for Ken Adkins with the tuning of B flat, F, G, E flat. That allowed for a low B to be played in just sixth position. The first inline bass trombone that was commercially made available was Olds's model S24G with the same tuning as before. And in 1974, Holton released their TR181, but instead of having a G valve, they used a G flat valve, making a low D with both valves pressed, also making a low B possible at about 
about fourth and a half position. The B-flat F G-flat D tuning system ended up being the most common system for bass trombones even to this day. Some, like Blair Bollinger, prefer and use the G and E-flat setup, which he himself trademarked. The craftsman side of things get weird. A B-flat F D B bass trombone, wow, low B in first position, designed by Dutch craftsman Rudd Pfeiffer made for Eric Van Leer was adopted by Jerry Lesnick of Schilke in Chicago, who ended up making one for Ed Kleinhammer. And it gets even weirder, rather than add even more tubing, some craftsmen added more valves. The farthest any of them got were three valve bases made in the 1970s by Larry Minnick from Los Angeles. And in 1978, Larry Ramirez of Holton tried making a four valve bass trombone, but never completed it. Though, one was completed last year. And that is how the double valve bass trombone came to be. As one trombone manufacturing renovation came to a close, another one was just getting started. Join me in the next chapter of the trombone's history where someone sets out to reinvent the valve of the trombone itself. If you guys enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more videos coming soon.